This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo. Two o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and with me is John David and Hi, John. Yeah, it's good to be here. Professor again. of history at HPU. <laughs> Wonderful to have you here. Yeah. And we're initiating the notion of Trump Week. You know, uh, there's yeah, other right. sites and right. you know, and video uh, you know organizations around the country right. that cover Trump. Yeah. Uh, one called Trump Government that interests me. Oh, that's interesting. You know, what, what's it like? You know, how yeah. is this world different in yeah. terms of government yeah. than before? Um, and we, we need to look at it. We need to see it in a historical context. Really. Yes, yeah. I agree. So what's happened this week? I mean, whether, or within the last week or two, right, anyway. Right, right. So you, I think the, the, the biggest thing at Capitol Hill, at least, was the failure of the health care, right? The Republicans failed to repeal and replace Obamacare. And the thing is, this indicates that the Republican Party might not be able to govern as it's currently constituted. Yeah. I mean, you have uh, the, the right wing of the Republican Party is insistent that they're not going to compromise at all going to have to be some compromise for them to govern. And they've been called out by their leadership in the Senate. So this, this is a, it's a very big issue going forward. Tax reform coming up, they're going to have the same problem um, because uh, <clears throat> Trump would like to, to link tax reform to a border tax on goods coming into the United States. Yeah. And, and the Chamber of Congress Commerce, pardon me, which is a very conservative organization, has already come out very strongly against it. They're organizing right now to stop this bill dead in its tracks. So once again, you have a divided Republican Party uh, that can't, that is, we'll see. They might be able to get taxes done, but uh, I think it's going to be very difficult if Trump insists on a border tax, yeah. which is essentially a tariff. Yeah. That's what we're talking have about. Have a bad effect on the American consumer and American business. It, it, it could have all kinds of bad effects. A, a bad effect on the American economy. It could damage, uh, you know, relations with other nations. Uh, one could argue that it led to war uh, in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, there's all kinds of bad yeah. ramifications yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you talk about the ability to govern. You talk about the, um, you know, ability, I suppose, of Congress to come together. Yeah. Uh, which certainly it hasn't been together right. in a long time, right. uh, and how it can work, if at all, with the president. Um, and I guess my first question, so many questions about this, really. <laughs> my first question is, um, you know, what drives him? It certainly can't be, you know, anything simple. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mentioned in this context this book I'm reading called Democracy in Chains, mm. which where an investigative reporter went to the South and she found out about James Buchanan, mm. who had this long view of trying to turn the government upside down, of um, you know, taking the money and putting it in the hands of the rich, taking it away from the poor, mm, yeah. no social safety net, uh, back to robber baron days, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, that it's a long plan by James Buchanan, who died in around 2000, mm. uh, and it's sort of um, you know, a way for there to be a constitutional revolution, he mm, called it. Yeah, yeah. And they tried with the benefit, they are trying with the benefit of the Koch brothers um, to fund a national initiative um, you know, to change things, to move in that direction. Yeah. And they have been to some extent successful by having, you know, Republican right-wingers run for office, right, right. funding them against, in, in primaries, funding them against the, you know, middle-of-the-road Republicans, right, right. so that the whole Republican machine has turned. You know, and, yeah. and I think it's a, it's a certain danger in saying, well, these are the same Republicans as before. They're not. So yeah. many different members of Congress now that we would not have elected a few years ago. Right, right. Uh, so we have a, the whole thing is in process. The Coke machine, if you will, <laughs> yeah. is in process. <laughs> and so, you know, what drives Trump knowing that he's going to run into so many issues within the Republican Party right, and right. within the Republican establishment, if you will? Right, right. Well, of course, the, the question of what drives Donald Trump, that's a kind of frightening question, so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I can answer that. Yeah. Uh, only Trump knows, and I think he doesn't know on any particular day. Uh, so, but I, I do think what's driving him right now in a political sense is Trump is a very insecure person, and he has decided, I don't think he even decided, I don't think he even thought about it. He is uh, governing for this very small part of the, the electorate, 30% or less, and it's also a minority of the Republican Party, the Tea Party and the extreme, you know, Freedom Caucus types. He's governing towards them. So the decisions he's making are, you know, the rest of us, who cares? He's, he's really governing with this 
towards this very small minority. So this indicates the, the really the terribly fragmented nature of the Republican Party, yeah. that they can't elect a leader that would actually not even be able to lead their whole party, much less the whole country. So, um, <clears throat> and of course, there's a historical context of that. So, um, yeah, we, we okay. should talk about that. Sure. I mean, you know, have we been here before, or is this brand new material? No, we have actually been here before. It's, we were here in the late seventies, uh, late sixties, early seventies, with the uh, with the Roosevelt Coalition, the New Deal Coalition. Uh, and, and there was a similar fragmentation that had taken place over decades. So when Roosevelt got elected and then re-elected in 1936, he really put together a terrific coalition. It was pretty amazing. I mean, he won four elections. He's a great politician. It, well, really a mastermind of, of putting politics together and putting this coalition together. So he had Southern Democrats who had always been Democrats. Uh, he put Southern, Southern Democrats together with African Americans who hadn't gotten quite to the, the level of the Civil Rights Movement yet, but who were moving in that direction. Uh, uh, urbanites, uh, the working class, the labor unions, and new immigrants, uh, all of, and then liberals. So all of these folks voted for Roosevelt. <clears throat> that didn't come so, easy. So you had, you had to be a master politician. Right, to do right. That. And the way he did this was in 1935, he decided he had to push his agenda to the left, and he passed the Social Security Act. He passed the Wagner Act, which established the National uh, Labor. Labor Relations Board, yeah. the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, this was a direct appeal to unions to vote for him. Um, and then he passed the WPA. He pushed all of these things through Congress. The WPA was a works program. It was a program for unemployed people. So. So it helped poor people. So Roosevelt did all of that, and then he reaped the gains in the election of 1936 when these folks who had seen this said, well, I'm going to vote for Roosevelt because he's supporting me. So, um, so he was able to actually shift the entire electorate to the left in so doing this and put together a very durable coalition, at least for another 40 years. It wasn't really until uh, 1980 with Ronald Reagan that, that, that this coalition fell apart. This was a very important piece of American history, it was, what it he was, did. It was incredible because he developed the New Deal, yeah. the New Deal which the Republican Party is continuing to attack and to try to dismantle today. All this time. But they've been <laughs> superbly unsuccessful at it, actually. The, the, the health care issue is another demonstration that American people want the government to work for them. Yeah. They don't want no government. They want a government that actually helps them. Yeah. So, uh, so, but the problem with the coalition from the first was that you had two warring parties in the coalition, Southern Democrats and African Americans. Uh, so, you know, these, these two groups went at it. And by 1948, uh, Southern Democrats were beginning to leak out of the New Deal coalition. This is, of course, the year when Harry Truman ran for president, and Truman uh, he, 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 he was in trouble, actually. We didn't, he didn't know whether or not he was going to get reelected, and so he decided to go for the African-American vote. And he did this by desegregating the military in the summer of 1948. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, and this is it's something... a big focus this, in those days. It was just correct. after the war, the we still had a big military. Civil rights advocates had been pushing for this for some time. So, but then, during the Democratic National Convention, Hubert Humphrey, mayor of Minneapolis, gets up and gives a speech in which he says the Democratic Party needs to move out from under the shadow of states' rights and into the bright sunshine of civil rights. And the Democrats from the South got up and they left the convention hall. Really? Yeah. They didn't like that. Yeah. They, they formed their own political party called the Dixiecrats, and they ran Strom Thurmond, senator, uh, as their presidential candidate. So this marked the beginning of the end of the, of the New Deal coalition. So yeah. it became more and more fragmented after that. Yeah. Again, in 1960, uh, Southern Democrats ran their own uh, presidential candidate. Uh, uh, and then in 1968, George Wallace ran mm -hmm. as an independent and actually got 13% of the vote. That 13%, if it had gone, if it had stayed in the Democratic Party, Hubert Humphrey would have easily been elected, but without it, he lost by 500,000 votes to Richard oh, Nixon. Oh, oh. 
which was more and, in and those days than it would be today. That's correct. That's correct. But that so that marked the real unraveling of the New Deal coalition. Then it remained for where, where was Kennedy on this? Uh, and Kennedy in 1960, once just like uh, Truman in 1948, wanted the African American vote. He also wanted Southerners' votes. And that's why uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson became his vice presidential candidate. Mm. But he wanted the African-American vote, and so he got into contact with Martin Luther King Jr. Right. And Southern Democrats were outraged about this. It split the Democratic Party, but not enough. I think uh, Johnson made a big difference for Kennedy, and Kennedy won the election in a, in, in a you know, very close election. So. Uh, so, so you've got this situation where it got tighter and tighter for the Democratic Party, and then, then they lost in 1968, and then they lost in a landslide in 1972. And you, by that time, you had Democrats who were really hard-boiled Democrats beginning to vote for Republicans, including what we would call Archie Bunker Democrats. <laughs> it's very important. You remember the show Archie Bunker, sure. of course. Archie was a working class guy. He was an he was an immigrant, you know, ethnic voter. Uh, and Archie Bunker was the type of voter who began to vote Republican. Why? Because African Americans moved into his neighborhood. <laughs> because they because he it's Archie Bunker the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he believed that. Uh, that LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, had given too much to African Americans. Civil was, Rights Act of 1968. That's yeah. correct, that he was kind of preferentially giving yeah. stuff uh, to African Americans, taxpayers' dollars that yeah. Archie was paying out of his paycheck. So yeah. there was this r politics of resentment, which actually worked very well, and it worked in 1972, and then it worked again in 1980, and Reagan got about 70% of the Archie Bunker Democrats. Oh, interesting. These are, these are working class types. They belong in the Democratic Party, but they, they voted for Reagan. So the country's turning right, and the country's turning race. Race so, is a big yeah, issue yeah, here. So it's an underlying it is, issue. It is. It's a very important issue because it's, it's the issue that keeps uh, Southern Democrats, uh, it, it moves, pardon me, Southern Democrats into the Republican Party. Yeah. Uh, this kind of coded campaign against uh, uh, African American welfare mothers uh, that keeps dem uh, Southerners that moves some of Southerners into the Republican Party and keeps them into the so, uh, into the Republican Party. So it's so it's really uh, race versus class issues, uh, and in the history of the United States, race has always trumped class. Don't use that term. Sorry. Okay, we're going to take a break. <laughs> Not because you used that term. <laughs> That's John David Ann, professor of history at HBU. And we're talking about Trump Week and all the things that flow out of the, the events and developments in our time, including some scary ones we'll talk about after this break. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii Fridays at 3 p.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. We explore environmental issues, political issues, keeping it local any way we can. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with John Davidon uh, here at uh, what, Trump Week yeah. on Think Tech, and right. we're talking about the things that have happened lately and how they fit in historical yeah. context. Yeah. So the, the directions, the vectors, you know, the, the historical mm, sea changes that you right. described a minute ago, right. are they still in play? Yeah, so, so Ronald Reagan wins in 1980 by putting together a new coalition. 
And that new coalition includes the Archie Bunker Democrats, it includes uh, the religious right, it includes conservative, traditional conservative Republicans. Uh, and so Reagan puts this coalition together. Some have argued that the coalition really didn't survive the 90s when, of course, Bill Clinton won two elections as a Democrat. But uh, if, you, if, you, if we could argue that it, survi that it has survived into the 21st century, then there's been a new addition to the Reagan coalition, and that's the Tea Party. The Tea Party in 2009, 2010, when it formed, this was a real innovation. And the Tea Party started running its own, just as you said earlier, Jay, it started running its own candidates against other Republicans. And so it's, it's actually actively trying to destroy the Reagan coalition yeah. and create a new, re, a, a new a, extremely... A transmutation of the whole Republican yeah, a, thing. a new extremely conservative Republican party. Yeah. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that most Americans don't identify as extremely conservative. A very small proportion, maybe 25% yeah, identify They have more that. power now than they did five years ago. And, and so uh, this is the part of the Reagan coalition that Trump decided to use. And he didn't think he could win. We didn't think he could win. Um, I, I think of it as a kind of uh, a, a kind of rip in time. <laughs> yeah, honestly, really, yeah, really, because really. Uh, he shouldn't have won running uh, running with this small minority. But but he he had a kind of uh, unconventional approach. Uh, he uh, he he had a populist message at a moment when when populism was you know. You know, we, we don't think about this typically, but Obama won twice on a populist message and then became a very conventional, much more kind of conventional president when he yeah. came into power. Yeah. Uh, but so, so Trump used a populist message and then there was a very weak Democratic well, candidate. Let me ask you this. So, so we go back, say, you know, 2010 or so, or 28, 9, 10. Right. And we have the uh, emergence of um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Republican Party that, that where ideology is more important, where they'd right. rather bring the country down than capitulate or negotiate yeah. on a given point. Right. The Tea Party approach. Right. Right. And I, I was always like shocked by that because I felt it was a violation of their oaths of office to mm. defend the Constitution, yeah. do the right thing by the, the country as a whole. Yeah. But they don't do that. They, they take one point, um, maybe it's uh, you know, abortion rights, and hold up a whole slate of legislation on that till they get their way, stamping their feet. Right. Um, right. Right. Strange that, and I, I wonder if that's ever happened before. You manipulate the whole system on one issue, and it's oh, an yeah. issue where yeah. not everybody agrees. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. it has happened. Yeah. Um, and uh, it happened in the 1850s, when, uh, when in this case, Democrats who did not want to hear about uh, the slavery issue and, and abolition because of course they were they were deeply supported by slaveholders in the South. Democrats were getting all of these petitions from the abolitionist movement out of New York State and some other places, uh, mostly New England. Uh, but these these abolitionists were sending dozens and dozens and dozens of petitions to be read on the floor of the Congress. That was the that was, that was the, the movie that Lincoln. Was, yeah, Spielberg. but that, that was the practice. They. They had to read the petitions. Well, there were so many of them that it was clogging up business. And they wanted that. Uh, well, that's what, yes, the, the abolitionists wanted Holding that. hostage, that's, holding that's Congress correct. hostage. They, they wanted this, and so, so the Democrats who controlled the Congress put in a so-called gag rule, which prevented these petitions from being read on the floor. Well, it's a long way from pure democracy, I would say. <laughs> so here we it's are. It's never been pure democracy. <laughs> no, in okay, fairness, thank you for never that. It's true, pure. I know. I, it I only say that. It uh, isn't <laughs> now. So, yeah. so say, you know, 20, 2010, we had the yeah. Tea Party emerge. Right. And now we have Trump, and, I, and there's a resonance going on. Right. Uh, they, re, re, you know, have a resonance with him, and he has a resonance with right. them. But what is it that brings them together, and how he healthy is that resonance? Well, okay, so, so the, the other thing about Trump is that he's, he's not a typical populist. He's actually a businessman. So he brings in the financial Republicans. They, they voted for him because they think, hey, he's a businessman. Yeah, the Wall Street guys actually supported him, even though he talked about tariffs, which Wall Street does not like at all. So, this, so here's the thing. I, I think that we haven't really uh, understood this very well, that the Republican Party in electing Donald Trump, in choosing Donald Trump, did not grapple with some fundamental issues. What is the identity of the party? 
Is it going to be a pro-trade party or a tariff party? Is it, a, is it the party of American supremacy or the party of American isolationism? They didn't have these conversations. Instead, they were transfixed by the spectacle of Trumpism. Okay? And then once he was elected, I think many Republicans thought, well, we're going to have this conversation now about what the party is about. No, they still haven't had that conversation. So the problem with the idea that Trump will transform the electorate and push it all, like, like Roosevelt did, push it all to the, the extreme right, is he's done nothing to convince the American people. There's been no conversation. That's why health care failed. That's why it's quite possible that uh, tax reform will fail, because he hasn't made the case. The truth is he doesn't know what the case is. So if you don't know what the case is, you're going to have a tough time actually making the case. Yeah, well, if you have an ignorant leader, you pay a big price. But, but query, <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> but, but query, though, yeah. what about the leadership in Congress? I mean, doesn't some of the responsibility for this fall on them? Why, why do you, um, you know, expect that Trump is going to solve these problems, yeah. address these issues? Yeah. He's, he's not up to it. Right. Why, why don't they do it? Well, they seem right. to have faded off the stage lately. Well, no, I, I mean, I think the Senate is where this is going to happen, and it already did happen with John McCain uh, kind of calling, good, the, good calling the Senate to task. Uh, and then sticking with it, sticking by his word. Okay, that's what that's what that's what American politics is about. Yeah, and that's what this country needs right now: is politicians of integrity standing up, men of courage, so to speak, standing yeah, up like and say, hey, "Yeah, standing up and say, hey, wait, wait, this is wrong. We're not going to do this." So I think that it's going to happen in the Senate. Quite frankly, it's going to be close, but I think you've got a small group of moderate Republicans there who are who have decided, you know what, uh, we're not for Trump. The problem for Trump is he's attacked every one of them. He attacked McCain. He attacked Murkowski. He attacked uh, the, the senator from Maine. Attacking his own, his yes. own party. Yes, so, so this is an extension of this very self-destructive uh, uh, Tea Party movement, uh, which was, you know, they attacked their own candidates. So, so you're going to see more of this, and I think... The upshot of this is that the Reagan coalition is in the midst of its collapse. Its collapse. Yes. Yeah. So, so I know it's strange to say it. The Republicans have a lot of political power right now, but it's not going to last. How, how do you see it devolving? Well, I think the, the biggest division right now is between moderate Republicans and the extreme right of the party. And uh, they're not going to agree on Trump. Uh, uh, and if... Trump can't even agree himself on what he stands for, uh, then uh, they're just going to, you know, they're going to fight it out with one another. And I think, uh, you know, uh, voters who came out for Trump, uh, especially in rural areas, might be one-time voters because they're already disillusioned yeah. about what's going on yeah, in Washington, yeah, D.C. Yeah. So as, as the party, the coalition, the Republican, the yeah. Reagan coalition, yeah. or the legacy of the Reagan yes. coalition, de de devolves, yeah. Um, what happens? What happens to Trump and his policies, his ability? You've already indicated it's going to be hard for him to get any of his issues through. Yeah. But what happens to the regular ebb and flow of government work? What happens yeah. to the yeah. efficacy of Congress? What well, happens to the relationship of Congress with its constituents? Right, right. So, so the, but the other thing about the American presidency in the 20th and 21st century is it's still very powerful. And so Reagan has already, uh, pardon me, <laughs> whoop, whoop, fro, fro, not so Freudian slip there. Trump has already exerted quite a bit of power through executive orders yeah. and, and is changing our policies Funny, on the that, environment. That's what, that's what Obama did. That's <laughs> true. The it's tool true because we live orders. in a divided country and it's yeah. hard to get a consensus. It's the only way to get anything so, done, yeah. yeah so, so, um, but the Democrats have made it clear they want, they want to work with Republicans and Democrats could actually benefit here. Okay, so the Democrats could maybe pull votes away from the Repub Republicans if they do it carefully, and they could, they could, they could develop uh, a, a kind of big tent centrist approach, which could, which could really benefit them in 2018 and even in 2020. We don't know what will happen with Trump and the Russia investigation. Uh, it, it's the the problem for the Republican Party right now is if they wanted to get rid of Trump, they've got this 30 percent. 30% of the electorate says, whatever Trump does is fine with me. I still mm -hmm. support well, it. Will that change if the party well, you know, comes apart? Yeah, I mean, it's already changing. The truth yeah. is that his base has really begun to erode quite badly. I think religious right 
uh, voters are getting sick of him because they see him as immoral um, and uh, and financial, re you know, traditional conservative Republicans who are financial Republicans are going, what, wait, you can't, you can't put tariffs on and so that's going to be a big fight. So, so this... And you as, see it in Pence. Yeah. I mean, is this issue about, is Pence going to run against him or not? Right. Is he collecting money or not? And the right. answer is, yes, he will. Yeah. And he is collecting money. Yeah. Yeah. And he can deny it, but I think yeah. it's clear from the newspapers that, yeah. he, that he's so, doing exactly so that. So, and Pence would be a much more conventional, traditional, conservative Republican. Yeah. And he could actually win the nomination on that basis. But yeah. what's he going to do with the Tea Party types? The extreme right wing of the party. They're going to oppose him. Uh, and and so his message, it, unless he goes completely populist, will not be populist, and therefore it's it's going to be you're going to see the Republican Party, the votes of the Republican Party shrinking, and and I, I think you know they've unfortunately uh, uh, they they set themselves on a pathway to minority party status in the future. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, the Democrats have a, a hard row also. I mean, they, they've lost their primacy. Uh, they've lost their, their vision, some people yeah. think. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not as serious as they might be. They're not as, not as organized, and yeah. their leadership hasn't really surfaced. And yeah. uh, you really wonder, how, you know. And it seems to me that all, all of these elected officials have a duty to defend the Constitution. Yeah. They all have a duty to make a deal. They all right. have a duty to keep the, the country right. balanced. Right. And they're not doing right. that. Yeah. So the question I put to you is, yeah. what does the next coalition look like, John? It's, it's hard to know. I mean, uh, you know, right now it looks like coalition building would come from the extreme right or the extreme oh, left, that's right? that's risky business, and, isn't it? And I, th I, I agree with that. I think it is risky business. I think that, you know, I think uh, one good election would cure the Democrats, uh, you know, pretty well. Um, but I, I do think the Democrats have to take account of the fact that they got beat at the polls on the issue of populism, which is their issue. They didn't get beat on national security. No, Hillary was actually stronger on national security. Uh, they didn't get beat on the economy. The economy was strong. Uh, the economy was not, you know, it wasn't something that overturned the election. It was the, the question of what is the Democratic Party doing about people whose incomes have stayed stagnant, the, the, the kind of the lower uh, yeah. third of the electorate. But they lost touch with that. Right, right. You know, and what's very interesting is a week ago, maybe a little less, the end of last week, was a piece in the paper that really struck me, is that they, they were at least considering bringing uh, anti-abortion uh, uh, principles and players yeah. Yeah. in under the Democratic tent. Yeah. That their platform now had room uh, I guess in order to reach a, some yeah. kind of pop, populist yeah. uh, approach sure. to things, sure. um, to allow for anti-abortion, which to me is a tremendous violation of all the trust that the supporters of the Democratic Party have put to them yeah. for low, all yeah. well, these this is, 30, 40 so, years. So this is the debate of the Democratic Party. Will it become the multicultural party? Will it go back to its roots in the working class and in uh, you know, the Archie Bunker Democrats? Will it go back? Uh, in that direction. I think the, the Democratic Party has always been fractious uh, and, uh, and I think it can actually go in both directions. Quite yeah. honestly, I think it has to go in both directions, yeah. but it needs leadership that can manage those different factions. The working class faction, the rural faction, and then the multicultural faction. Well, here's a hard question for you, John. Yeah. You know, we have a president who, short of some, you know, amazing revelation about the Russian connection, is probably going to stay in office, even though he does very crazy things, uh, my word. Um, but, you know, do we have the time to go through this process? Because the iterations you've described in the past, the American experience you described, yeah. sometimes it takes decades it does. Yeah, to reach, true. you know, balance or at least a, a new paradigm on yeah. these political connections. Yeah. And, you know, this, this, this war he's talking about with, uh, with North Korea, yeah. it doesn't give us a lot of time. You know, any <laughs> minute, is, it counts yeah, somehow. It's, 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 so do we have yeah. time for this? Well, What's going to happen? I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, it's very, the, the, the comment on North Korea is very dangerous. I mean, it belongs in a, in a novel. Not, not a, out of the words of a president. Maybe a B movie. Yeah, no, it's 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 very dangerous, and uh, uh, but I think he's got enough uh, national security people who have cooler heads who can prevail in that particular uh, debate. The, the 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 real issue is that with all of the fuss about 
the language, the, the kind of the noise that comes out of Trump's mouth is that the, the North Korean problem is not being worked on, or at least we don't know that it's being worked on. I mean, there should be a very strong approach to the Chinese to, to restart multilateral negotiations. I mean, that's the way out of this. Now they joined um, in the sanctions of the United Nations, but that's not, that's not uh, uh, what he wants from them. It's not right. what we want from right. them. It's more. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, um, so that's, that's definitely an issue. Um, we need to keep the country together. There's, there's no doubt about that. But he doesn't I, care to be a leader of the country, does he? Trump has not ever, no. I mean, he's, that's one of his characteristics is he's an insecure guy. And so what he did is he has responded to those who just fell in love with him. This small part of the, the extreme small part of the electorate that just loves him unconditionally. And that's what, apparently, that's what he needs is that kind of unconditional great love. great reality so. show, the best reality yeah. show yeah, ever. I mean, it's, it's Better quite, than The Apprentice, it, for sure. <laughs> it's quite a story, but and my, I think part we're of actually his, living it. <laughs> right. And part of his thing is to be unpredictable. Yeah. So that's why my last question to, was, yeah. is, to you is the most difficult question of all yeah. here on Trump Week, our discussion yes. of Trump. Right. So, John, given <laughs> all that we've discussed, all yeah. these historical processes, yeah. what do you think is going to happen next week in Trump week? Oh, I, I have no idea. I wouldn't even venture a Does guess. Does anyone know? Jay, I'm a historian. I don't prognosticate. Thank you, John <laughs> sure. David. Ed. Wonderful to talk to you. Aloha. Good to be here once again. <laughs>